We are baptizing in the service tonight again, and we praise the Lord for that. Uh, and we will also be uh, continuing something we kind of stumbled into last Sunday night, uh, talking about the armor of God there in Ephesians chapter 6. You only missed the introduction if you weren't here last Sunday night. So you come tonight for the good stuff, okay? <laughs> Quit talking about tonight. I'm here this morning preach to me. That's what you're saying. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. Paul said, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Father, I ask you this morning to help us prepare our hearts. Lord, may they be as tilled ground. God, that they'd be fertile. And that we'd see fruit today. Uh, God, through the preaching of your word. Pray that your will be done. God, we pray uh, that whatever needs to be done in our lives and our hearts today be accomplished. We'll thank you. Praise you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. I want us to think about this morning, and I want to talk about uh, the subject of the heart of a true ministry. The heart of a true ministry. Now the book of 1 Corinthians is an interesting study. If you've not studied 1 and 2 Corinthians, I'd encourage you at least to take some time and read it. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, we just leap into this book. You can tell right out of the shoot that Paul has to deal with the subject or the thought of contention among the people and discord. Now we know Proverbs 6 teaches us there are some things that God hates. And one of the things that God hates, the Bible says, is he who sows discord among brethren. And so we realize then today that contention or dissension or discord among people, division among the people of God especially, is not something that God's pleased with. And we've warred against it. We fight it. We do all that we can. Because it's in our nature to pack up or to be in a camp, to identify with one group or the other, and to pit one side against the other. And it's in that nature of people. You can see it. Some of the things that we're seeing today, we had the deal last night, the little prayer vigil, uh, invulnerable for our, our community and, and all these things. And one of the things that you're trying to fight against are people that are against one another, maybe politically or culturally or racially, that we draw all these lines between one another. It's amazing to me to hear people bash other generations, recognizing that people they love are in that generation. I can't stand to hear a group of young people talking about old people. I can't understand why we would talk about the generation that brought us here. I can't understand why an older generation would talk about young people. The very people that represent our children and our grandchildren. And I would say this, if you're alive today, you're kind of a part of this generation. <laughs> If you're alive today, you're kind of numbered among what's going on. When they remember what happened in 2016, 100 years from now, they're not going to care who represented what age group. They're going to say all them idiots in 2016 made this big old mess, right? And so, but it's just our nature to pit against people that make us uncomfortable or who are not like us or who are for us or who are against us. And one of the first instances we see in the New Testament is here at the church of Corinth. And Paul has to write to them. And the heart of his ministry, there were people who had divided up in camps, basically appealing to the one who had led them to the Lord, to those who had brought them to Christ and preached the gospel to them. Some with a man named Apollos, others with one named Cephas, some after Paul. And they were divided among the people. Each one had each particular person who they thought was the bell cow, if you will. Of, of religious speaking or preaching. And so they adhered to only what they had said and what they had done and it caused a great turmoil in the church. And so when Paul begins to write to them in verse, uh, we we'll see in chapter 1, you see that right out of the shoot, he's talking about uh, there's division and discord among the church. We did a series not long ago on Paul's begging of the church and all the times that Paul used the phrase, I beseech you, brethren. In 1 Corinthians 1.10 here, in the first verse as we lead into this, Paul says there in verse 10, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. He talks about their division in the church. Also in verse 17, 
Paul says this, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach. Because many of them were talking about being baptized. Who baptized them? Baptized by Apollos. Baptized by Cephas. Baptized by Paul. I'm in this group. I'm in that group. I'm representing this generation or this culture or this side of the track, if you will. I'm from this group. That's the group I appeal to. Paul said, I didn't come to baptize. That's not what I was here for. I came to declare to you the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But to preach the gospel, he says, not with wisdom of words. Not so that you would appeal to me. Not so that you would appeal, Paul says, to how I preach or what I preach. But that the gospel would be what drew you. And the gospel would be what appealed to you and what ministered to your heart. And he goes on and says in verse 17, Lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Is that not one of the scariest thoughts in all of this world? That the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ be made of none effect in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That we have within our flesh the ability to take the light entirely off of Christ. To take the light in Christ. You don't believe me? Read the book of Revelation chapter 3. The Laodicean church was in such a spiritual shape that Jesus was on the outside of His own church. <laughs> now I can tell you, and I'm kind of homeless at the moment. Kind of a nomad, if you will. But I've got a place to stay. And as long as I'm there, I'm just going to call it my house. <laughs> and so my house, where I live, where my family is, we've got locks to keep you out. We've got locks to keep ours in. <laughs> We're set up. But I can tell you about my house. You might get me out of my house. Hey, no doubt, I'm not mean, I'm not tough. No doubt about it. You might get me out of my house. But you're going to have your hands full. And I'm going to tell you something else about old Ruth. You might get me out of my house, but I'm coming back in. You're going to have to get me out of there again. If you think the first time was rough, second time's going to be even harder because I'm going to have a weapon in my hand. Right? I'm like my brother Joe said at homecoming. No, that gun didn't kill anybody. Joe Cannon killed him. Amen? <laughs> you come and get me again, you're going to have more than me to deal with. And so, you understand what I'm saying, what I'm talking about. And, and the Lord, how... How delicately He has dealt with His people in the sense that we find a place where He's outside His own church. And do you know what He's doing? Let me tell you what I'd do. I'd kick the door down and I'd come in and try to run you out. That would be my aspiration. Jesus, standing outside of His church, just stands at the door and knocks. And says, if any man, a corporate situation that's hinged on an individual condition. The whole church now has Jesus on the outside. But Jesus says, if just one of them to hear my voice and open that door, then I'll come in and have fellowship with Him. And when you realize the condition of that church, then you can see it's not so far-fetched for us to read Paul's exhortation to the Corinthians and understand that if they in the early days of the church could do it, and if in Laodicea in the last stages of the church they will do it, then surely we should believe today that we can be part of the vehicle that omits Christ and His cross from the church. In many religious groups already, they're dismissing sing, singing and songs about the cross and about the blood of the Lord Jesus. I'm happy to tell you, among all the songs that my children sing, one of their favorites is What Can Wash Away My Sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And last night at the vigil, Brother Daniel Bright stood up, and when he spoke, he made reference to the blood of Jesus. Jacob elbowed his mama and said, He just said the blood of Jesus. He was fired up about it. I want my kids to know the second part of that song. Oh, precious is the flow that washes white as snow. No other foul I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Can you see what Paul is saying? Considering the danger of taking the light off of Christ is we remove the ability or the effect, if you will, of the cross of Christ from the church. It is the cross that keeps us grounded. When you look, when I survey the glorious cross, you understand the great price that was paid for our soul. And if nothing can humble you and make you overlook some things, you should be able to look at the cross and see that in the big picture, our little temporal issues do not matter. But Christ died for those to be saved. And it's our job to declare the gospel and bring them in. <laughs> 
division in the church, verse 10 and 17. You see what divided them? As he goes on now to verse 18, we're still in chapter 1, verse 18 to verse 25, but I want you to see in verse 18 there, chapter 1, that he makes this statement. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Those who have no desire to hear of Christ will find no glory in the cross. Those of us who have been saved by the cross of Christ can't take our eyes off of the reality that Jesus suffered and died in my place. So that I could be saved from a sinner's hell. So I could be brought into fellowship with the Lord Himself. And so that I could have a home in heaven one day. Paul said that when we preach the cross to those that perish, it's foolishness to them. They don't want to hear about the cross. They want to be free to live however they choose. They want to be free to go and steal and lie and cheat and pervert the gospel and use it for their own benefit. But Paul said to us who are saved, the preaching of the cross is the power of God. And he says to us that it's not who preaches it, nor is it how they preach it, but it's what they <coughs> preach, and it's the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. The heart of a ministry is the gospel message. The heart of the ministry is that we take what God says and say it. That we take what a guy told me one time, take what the Word says and say it. It's what a man told me. Be a lion in the pulpit, he said, and a lamb on the ground. You go on now in verse 18, you see in verse 24, he makes this statement. Paul says, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks. All of a sudden, this dividing line that's been placed between these two, Jews and Greeks, blacks and whites, old ones, young ones, men and women, Americans, non-Americans, right? Whatever that line is that we believe that separates us from these people. Like the old song says, the ground is level, Calvary. Yeah. And he says to us in verse 24, unto them that are called, both of Jew and Greek, both of any sect or group you'd like to mention. You might not like this, but it's the truth. Amen? Amen. Amen. Of any sect or any group that's mentioned, he says in verse 24, <laughs> that the gospel, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. <coughs> Now you go on and you see the danger of division. He says in verse 30, But of Him are you in Christ Jesus, whom of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, He, hath glor he that glorified, let him glory in the Lord. Now what he leads up to this statement with talking about is that God has chosen to take the foolish things of this world and confound the minds of great wisdom. One evidence as great as any that I can see is since 2001, we have been at war with a group of people that we've had a hard time identifying. They have no country. They have no creed. They hide behind the extreme acts of their religious culture. But the fact of the matter is, there is a group of people out there that has terrorized for 15 years the greatest military power in the history of the world. God can take the foolish, ignorant things of this world and break us if that's what it takes to bring our focus back to Christ. Amen. We can bow our chest out and fly our bombers and consider ourselves the strongest country that ever lived. But the power that we rest in today is not the power of the United States government or the political system or the power of the strongest military, whatever it was. If we survive as a nation, it will be solely on the power of God. Amen. And that is by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the less of this we adhere to, the more destruction and chaos and terror we can expect in our own country, on our own soil. When we went to war in Iraq after 9-11, everybody said we can fight them there instead of here. But our media, for some reason, refuses to admit the fact that those very same attacks are taking place in our country. Those very same attacks are taking place in our country, on our soul, against civilians, and murdering our people in our country, and we're so blinded by our chaos and our political nonsense that we can't see it. That we're in a fight, and that we're in a war. And I'm going to tell you, church, if we're ever going to minister, we better minister now. 
If we're ever going to love somebody, we better love them now. If we're ever going to stand together as a church, we better stand together right now. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. There's your introduction. How excited are you? First thing I want you to see is Paul's angle in preaching. After Paul gives us chapter 1, in leading into chapter 2, the first thing that Paul says, and I. He's saying in reference to what I just said. In reference to chapter 1 and verse 31, according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Paul says in light of that, let me tell you about me. Paul said, I, brethren, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech. Paul's angle was not to entice with his words or his oratory skill. I didn't come to you with excellency of speech, he said. I came to you not with wisdom. I declare to you the testimony of God. You see, his point was not to be a shining star. His point was not to stand out. His point was not to be recognized or remembered. But his point was to deliver the message of Christ. His priority was the testimony of God. His priority was to deliver to them the message of hope, the message of faith. Here's the problem. Paul is dead. <laughs> He's dead. Ruth's going to die. The next preacher's going to die. The next preacher's going to die. But the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ lives forever. And it is never any less powerful or capable to change the hearts and lives of people than it was the day you heard it preached from your favorite preacher in all the world. The gospel is still the gospel. And what Paul said, I didn't come to you with excellency of speech. Don't start, don't start at home adhering to me. You don't want to be Paul's group. You don't want to be Apollos' group. You don't want to be Cephas' group. You want to be Jesus' group. And that's what Paul is declaring and trying to exemplify here. Is you don't want none of what I got. I didn't come to you with excellency of speech. I didn't come to you with great wisdom. I came to you and shared with you the testimony of God. Paul's angle was to deliver the message of God. What was his purpose? His purpose in verse 2. He said, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That we might not make the preaching of the gospel, as he said, of the cross of Christ of none effect. That I determined not to know anything among you because I had no desire to understand your quarrels or your bickers or your fight. I had no desire to be placed on one side or the other. I had no desire to represent any camp, let alone this ridiculous camp that you've now pitted against my brother Apollos and my brother Cephas. But rather, I came to you with no knowledge of anything other than the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and Him crucified, because that's the answer today. That's the hope today. That's the promise today, is Jesus and His glorious cross and what He did for His people. That's what ignites worship in our heart and our soul. We can be entertained by a fiery message, but we will not be exhorted, nor will we be drawn or grown by anything other than a truthful message that comes from the Word of God. And the beautiful part about that is, is though many men have preached this Gospel, and many far greater than I, I like what Spurgeon's grandpa said one time, when they were called to preach at a cottage meeting. And in the cottage meeting, Spurgeon was not there yet. They called on his grandfather to preach. They had assigned a text from Matthew chapter 6. And as his grandfather began preaching the text, Spurgeon fights the blizzard, walks in the back door, just a young man. His granddaddy wipes his nose, wipes tears from his eyes, closes his Bible, tells Spurgeon where he left off, and tells that group of people to introduce his grandson. Though my grandson may preach the gospel far greater than I, he'll never preach a greater gospel than the one I've presented to you. And he sat down, and as the story went, Spurgeon got up and picked up from the verse he left off, and like my baby says, shook the corn. Amen? And brought the thunder. But the beauty of that is, is though the gospel can be preached better, there is no better gospel. And Paul said, even if an angel comes and preaches to you a gospel other than that which you've received, send it away. Condemn it. Do rid with it. Because it won't help you. It'll hurt you. It'll mess you up. Paul's angle was to deliver the message of Jesus Christ. The heart of the ministry, the heart of our church, we're not here to advertise Antioch Church. We're not here to advertise our good-looking preacher. <laughs> Though I believe the Lord will forgive you for that. <laughs> Amen? We're here today to fill our link in the chain of life to promote the cause and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That's our angle. 
Not only do you see Paul's angle, verse 1 and verse 2, in verse 3 and verse 4, I want you to check out Paul's attitude. Paul's attitude. You know what can ruin a service? A bad attitude. You know what can ruin a good... I can preach you 45 minutes of the best sermon you ever heard in your life and give you 30 seconds of bad attitude to ruin the whole thing. Wouldn't you agree? If Ross got up here with an old snide attitude and got up here talking about how everything was so bad and he was so upset and so stirred up about everything in the world and how it's too hot in here, it's too cold in here, y'all look sleepy. I preached revival one time and there's a dozen people there for the revival and the guy got up to leave the scene and he got down and there's one of them that leaned over the mic and talked like that. And every time he exhaled, you had to... You know what I mean? You don't know how to talk on the mic if I hear you breathing. Stop. <laughs> He leaned over the mic with a monotone. He said, I remember back way day revival this church. They'd have to open the windows and people would sit outside because of all the music and food. And I thought, yeah, I bet you wouldn't leave singing. <laughs> Good Lord. Bad attitude to kill it like that. I can take my wife on a date, right? It'd be sweet to have flowers, have her to this, this place that came to Burger King. She was praying about her favorite whopper. Right? Well, I'm her favorite whopper. <laughs> and married couples were right or wrong. One 60 second bad attitude can ruin the whole night. Right. <laughs> it's amazing. You throw you one little fit about something stupid. And you ruin everything. Paul's attitude going into this thing is very interesting when you think about it. The first thing in verse 3 is he admits some things. One of the things that I'm finding is very hard for men especially to admit is that we're scared. Because we've been taught we're not supposed to fear. We're not supposed to be scared. But we are. You're scared. The baddest man in this room is scared. He won't admit it, but he's scared. Because it's a scary world. You know what's scary? I, I never was scared about anything about a kid. I mean that seriously. I, mean, I know it's funny, but it's true. It's amazing that things start scaring me when I had kids. I didn't think kids, you know, you just think kids are just going to spontaneously die all the time. <laughs> you just think that when they're born, when they're little kids, they're just dying all the time. Everything's going to kill them. It's going to kill them. And I'm going to tell you right now, they'll take a better leap than daddy can. I run to the mailbox and back, and I can't walk the next day. <laughs> They can run, do somersaults, clip, land on their back, their head, slap each other, cut each other with knives, <laughs> chase each other with sticks, get attacked by the dog, and forget about it the next day. <laughs> it's amazing to just watch them go. My kids want to race around the house and run around the house in circles, and they'll get back and want to go again and want to go again. And we're like something. These are not my kids. <laughs> Man. If I'm like what the thing said, you see me running, you better take off too, because something happened. <laughs> <laughs> I like the old deal when the bear got after the two guys, and the guy took off running. He said, How are you going to outrun this thing? He said, I ain't got to outrun that thing. I just got to outrun you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My like guy got attacked by the bear that time, and, and, and the bear was spinning to eat him, and the guy closed his eyes and said, Lord, please make this bear a Christian. <laughs> Lord answered his prayer and the bear folded his hand and said, Lord bless this food. That I'm <laughs> Paul's attitude was an attitude of humility in the sense that you see his admission there in verse 3. This is something very few men would be willing to admit. This is the great apostle. This is the corn shepherd. Underneath the Lord Jesus, there's probably not a person that you've heard more about in the New Testament than the apostle Paul. And Paul says to this church, I was with you in weakness. And I was with you in fear. And I was with you in trembling. Paul was in a condition that we titled today anxiety. Paul was dealing with fear and frustration to the sense that he was scared to death. And was you ever been so scared you were shaken? I've been scared. I don't know that I've ever been so scared that I was shaken. Paul was scared. He was full of fear. And for him to admit this to these people is for him to tell them, the power that you saw was not of me. The power that you saw was the power that lives far beyond me. And that was the power of the message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's approach as he goes on in verse 4 where he says, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words. You didn't make the decisions you made because of me. You made the decisions you made because of Christ. 
You fell on your face and confessed and repented, not because of Paul, but because of the message Paul preached, which so happens to be the message of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is what's beautiful, because we can preach the same message. We can move by the same gospel. We can make the same decision these people made by the power of God. Paul's attitude going into this thing is he makes this admission and reveals his approach, but then he hangs it all. Kind of like you take off your jacket and you hang it on the nail. This nail that he hangs it all on is this acknowledgement that he makes in verse 4 where Paul says to him, what you saw was a demonstration of the spirit, of the spirit and power. What you saw was the power of the Holy Ghost to God. If you've been saved today, it's not because of the trickery or the deceitfulness or the tomfoolery of people. And that's what's wrong with the non-believers today. Is they think that somebody's been emotionally played by somebody who does believe that they are wrong. They are wrong. For I know who I believe. I had a conversation with a man just the other day and I told him for you to tell me that Jesus does not exist would be the same ignorance in my sight as if you heard me say your mother didn't exist. You can't tell me who I've had a personal relationship with for years now. You can't tell me he's not there. You might tell me you don't believe he's there. But you ain't got no business trying to convince me any more than I can tell you your mama don't exist. Because I've seen him, I've heard him, I've felt him, I've walked with him, he's listened to me. <laughs> Whew. Paul's attitude was an attitude that we all should have. That we don't have the ability to entice people by our much speaking or good speaking or well speaking, but that our job today is simply to present the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, to wave the banner of Christ, to wave the banner of our Lord and acknowledge the fact that if anything happens around here, it's going to happen by the power of the Spirit of God. The same Spirit of God that saved your soul. The same Spirit of God that was able to penetrate the walls of sin and reveal to your heart that you were lost and undone without God or His Son. The same Spirit. Man, if we shared testimonies in here of how you were saved, some of you were saved. I, I, I like going to church service one time and uh, Richie Kelly was playing the piano and he was playing the song and it was on a Monday, somebody touched me and people stand up that was saved on a Monday, saved on a Tuesday, saved on a Wednesday, saved on a Thursday, saved on a Friday. I was saved on a Thursday. Uh-huh. Uh, so revivals go Sunday through Wednesday. You don't have service on Thursday. How in the world did that happen? By the power of the Spirit of God. Now I came to the altar in a revival service that's not supposed to be on Thursday night, but they did. And it was Brother Woodson McGuffey's daddy, Harold McGuffey, that preached the meeting. I got saved. Then. And I came to the altar and got saved that night in a revival meeting. My wife, on the very far contrary of how I was saved, was saved in her car on the side of the road by herself. Do you believe there wasn't even a preacher there to hold her hand? <coughs> Do you believe that she wasn't even moved by a powerful song or a great singer or a great preacher, but rather she had avoided everything I had tried to put on her and was able somehow to thwart my best effort to see her saved and went out and got saved all by herself by the power of the Spirit of God because of the message of the Gospel. It wasn't for my enticing words or my pressure or my pull because I'm going to tell you right now, if I ever wanted to see anybody saved, it was her. And God saved her by the power of His Spirit. And Paul's attitude is simply that. We've got to acknowledge the fact that anything good comes out of us, it's going to come by the power of the Spirit. It's not by our enticing words. One of the things that I have found so interesting in preaching now for 11 going on 12 years, one of the most interesting things about preaching is that the days that I have got up with the sermon, not the sermon, the sermon, anybody? The one. The next big hit. Right? will be the day that I let you look at me like i got something on my face. It don't matter how hard I preach, no matter how high I jump, no matter how much I wave my hands around, it ain't working. And there's been days where I've gotten in my office and God give me something during the week that I scratch out on a post-it note and just put the thoughts and scriptures to it that God gives me and don't put anything of me into it, but rather just draw the simplicity of the gospel message and get up here and preach it. And you throw your Bibles in the air and run laps around the room and say, I've never heard it in this fashion. A little overdone. One of the most humbling things about preaching is how little you really have to do with it. And how God is able to use you in your ignorance. Not in you, but in spite of you. Use you to bring something of any appreciable amount of power Spirit of God into service. It blows my mind, but it is the greatest thing in all the world. And that's what Paul said. 
It wasn't because of my preaching. It was because of the power of the Holy Ghost of God. You see Paul's angle, Paul's attitude. And the last thing I want you to see is Paul's aim in verse 5. We're talking about the heart of ministry. The heart of the minister. He says to us in verse 5 now that all of this was so that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but that your faith would stand in the power of God. Paul warns them here. Well, he warns them of one thing and encourages them towards something else. One, don't put your faith in things that are temporal. Don't put your faith in a spark. Don't put your faith in a person. Don't put your faith in people. Don't put your faith... There's people. I, I like what a guy said one time. He said, never quote a man while he's living. Because he'll live long enough to mess it up. Because as soon as you go, and I've lived to see that. Men that I have quoted, who I perceived to be great men, fell flat on their faces. And their testimony was of no more quality whatsoever for me to share what they had said or what they had done. I in one revival meeting had a lady come up. She worked for the sheriff's office in that town. And she came up that night during the invitation, bawling, squalling, crying, snotting, doing all that stuff, you know. And she told me, I've been out of church, and I know I'm saved, and I'm a member of this church, and I've been out of church. And she turned around and held her hands up. She told that church, I want y'all to know that I'm back. And the church clapped, and they praised God, and it was the greatest thing they'd ever seen. And she was there. And I preached revival two weeks later, down the road from there. No, maybe about two months later. Down the road from there, about 15 minutes, and I was preaching. And I shared that testimony about that lady getting right with God and getting back in church. And somebody from their church was there, and she said she never came to another service. I said, well, man, they basically told me not to quote her until she died. <laughs> <laughs> Don't put your faith in people. That's what Paul said. Paul says there in verse 5 that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but that it would stand in the power of God. Don't put your faith in people. Focus your faith on the power of God. That's the preaching of the cross. That's the power of God. If you ever need to wonder about the power of God, look back at the cross. If you ever need to wonder if God's got enough power to save you from a situation, look at that cross. It's the, it is the foundation of everything we believe. The cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and the message of the cross of Calvary and the sacrificial death and the atoning blood of Christ and the regeneration of lost, dead, unregenerate man is the picture of the power of God. And I tell you, if God can reach into a dead, lifeless, unregenerate, hell-bound, hell-deserving, sin-stricken soul and bring life and bring the presence of the Spirit of God, turn it from bad to good, from dead to life, from darkness to light, then there's not one issue, not one problem, not one pain, not one thing that our God cannot do. Amen. And that's the heart of a ministry. Is that we go out of here not by the strength or the power of man, but in the power of God. Because I don't have to defend myself when I stand in the power of God. And much as Spurgeon once said about defending the Word of God, he said it was like defending a caged lion. Just open the cage, baby, she'll defend herself. I have no apology to make. I have no, I have no speech to give, no defense to offer. I believe. Thus shall my conduct follow. May God be seen in our lives, in our walks, in our ministries, so that others may know Him. Stand with me. Father, thank you so much for our love and God for everything you've given us. Lord, for the love You've given us, for the grace You've given us, for the mercy You've shown us, we pray that the power of God rests on this church. That the power of God that brought forth the miracle of the cross of Calvary and the salvation of sinners, God, be the power in which we invest. God, it is the power that knows no dividing line. God, the power that knows nothing other than the will of our Father. And God, I pray that we would be those who seek to do and to experience nothing but the favor of Your perfect will. May the power of God rest on our home, our marriages, our family, as we've been called in a hellish world to raise our children to know You. May our kids know the message of the cross. May they know the power of the blood. If only by education, God, until that day comes that the Spirit gives them grace to see the light and then by experience, they may know the power of God. Give us the grace of the church to stand on Your Word, to believe Him, 
to preach it, to obey it, to apply it to everything that we do. May it be the foundation and the root of our very existence for Your glory. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. I don't know how many of you today would say that you genuinely desire to see a renewal or a revival even of the power of God. But I will say to you, before we'll ever see what we can see in our churches, we're going to have to see it in our homes, we're going to have to see it in our families. We're going to have to see men and women committed beyond this building to the power of God in their lives and on their lives. God can save your marriage. God can give you grace to raise your kids to know Christ. But you're going to have to surrender your life, your agenda, to Him. And if you, my friend, cannot look to the cross of Christ, and as Paul said, in light of the mercy of God, I beseech you, brethren, to present yourself to Him. You can't look to the cross and find enough motivation to do what He's called you to do. I would have a hard time believing that you'd ever experience the power of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Be saved today if you've not been saved. Come today and surrender your life to Him. Let's do what Christ wants us to do. If not us, who? If not here, where? If not now, we. Let's do as God would have us to as we offer this invitation. Brother Robert.